Hello everybody and welcome to another tutorial uh, by me, James Pfeiffer, the Clinical Teaching Fellow for Acute Medicine at the Royal Free. Uh, this is a tutorial, again, that was delivered at the Royal Free Hospital uh, and this is for all the students who either want to refresh the uh, tutorial or the students who are based at the Whittington or UCLH and of course you are very welcome uh, to all use this tutorial and pass on as appropriate. Uh, this du the video uh, version of this will be uploaded onto YouTube. So, what are we going to talk about in this tutorial? We're going to talk about background radiation and IRMA, which I'll explain in a moment, requisites for good imaging practice, anatomy of a chest x-ray, and some of the common chest x-rays in acute medicine, with a few little uh, chest x-rays uh, thrown in for you to have a look at and think about what the diagnosis or not might be. So I hate to bore you with physics so early on, and I know that I told my students that I hated my physics A-level, but it is important to have an understanding of the basic principles of uh, physics uh, when it comes down to X-rays and ionizing radiation. So as a reminder, radiation is a transfer of energy from one location to another as a wave. X-rays are a form of ionizing radiation, uh, i.e. that it knocks an electron out of its orbit, leaving a positively charged atom. Uh, um, hopefully you'll all remember the electromagnetic spectrum. I think it's fair to say at my age that I have forgotten it. But uh, X-rays have a wavelength of 10 to the 2 to 10 to minus 3 nanometers and a frequency of 3000 tetahertz to 1020 hertz. A typical X-ray photon energy of 10 to the 3 to 10 to 6 electron volts. And here is that electromagnetic spectrum which I'm sure you all remember from your physics courses. So there is indeed background radiation everywhere we go. Now the vast majority of this is atmospheric radiation, which accounts for about 50%. This is otherwise known as radon. Uh, you'll also see that there is medical background radiation, uh, occupational, so this might be those who work in uh, the nuclear industry, for example, uh, Sellafield, for example, uh, fallout, which hopefully is a very rare phenomenon, um, unless you happen to watch Chernobyl by HBO. Uh, there's also cosmic uh, radiation, gamma radiation, and internal radioactivity. You might find that a little bit odd, but actually um, you'll notice in the slide that I've put Brazil nuts, which actually indeed contain radioactive potassium-40 and tritium. Uh, that must be a reason why I don't eat nuts very often. So what's IRMA all about and why? So IRMA is Ionizing Radiation and Medical Exposure Regulations, uh, E-IRMA. What's important, if we're going to do any kind of investigation, hopefully you'll we'll appreciate by now, that it's important to understand why we're doing that test, what do we want to achieve, and how is it going to alter uh, the management of our patient. So, for example, if you examine a patient in A&E, they have SATs of 85, uh, left basal crepitations, and obviously you're going to be concerned about pneumonia, and therefore the radiological test of a chest x-ray is important to confirm that diagnosis and assess the severity and extent of that pneumonia. So it's important that you can justify the test uh, which you wish to have done. It's also important to think about, uh, if you like, the environmental principle of optimization of protection. You want to make sure about when you're thinking about doing a test, the likelihood of incurring exposure, the number of people exposed, and so on. You want to make sure that any dose given to any one individual is as low as possible. Now, this is quite important to think about um, when pregnant patients, for example, uh, may ask you a question about uh, the risk of radioactivity of, say, a chest x-ray versus a VQ scan versus a CTPA scan uh, in the investigation of uh, pulmonary embolism, for example. To give you a comparative view on this slide here, I have put the radiation doses from various medical procedures. You can see the dotted line shows the average annual dose of background radiation. Now, in comparison, you can see the dental x-ray, chest x-ray, and mammogram, fairly standard tests to have done, uh, are relatively small doses of radiation compared to an angiogram, which is much larger, uh, larger cardiac CT. Now, you can see here that angioplasty has quite an extensive range from uh, 10, uh, well, around 10 millisieverts to about 60 millisieverts, 
and this is because angioplasty is a type of procedure uh, that will vary significantly. So, for example, a patient comes into A&E, has a suspected STEMI, will have an angiogram, then angioplasty, plus or minus stenting. That stenting may be an easy procedure, it may take a long time. Therefore, of course, your radiation exposure will vary significantly. Uh, you'll also notice that a dual isotope stress test or a myocardial perfusion scan can be a fairly static uh, range between 20 and 40 millisieverts. When compared to other modalities, uh, you'll notice it in the uh, third column, uh, it talks about the time period for equivalent effective dose of natural background radiation. And knowing a few of these off the top of your head can actually be quite useful if a patient asks uh, and you want to think about it and know some figures off the top of your head. So to give you some examples, a chest x-ray, which has a typical effective dose of 0.2 millisieverts, the time period for that is only 2.4 days. Compare that to a lumbar spine x-ray, which has 1.5 millisievert dose, which is equivalent of 75 chest x-rays or 182 days of background radiation. Therefore, for example, lumbar spine x-rays should always be thought about conscientiously. A CT head, for example, an often necessary procedure uh, in acute medicine, is equivalent to 100 chest x-rays and 243 days, so just under a year. A CT abdomen, however, is 8 millisieverts or 400 chest x-rays or 2.7 years. In comparison to some environmental um, and occupational exposures to radiation, you'll probably recognise the pictures uh, on this slide. In the bottom left-hand corner, we've got a typical chest X-ray, which is right at the bottom at 0.1 millisieverts. On the right-hand side, we've got a full-body CT scan, which is 10 millisieverts. So, for example, um, in A&E, in a major trauma case, uh, we do what's called pan-scan trauma scans, where the patient has effectively a head-to-toe CT scan, and that's uh, equivalent to 10 millisieverts. Now, you can see that actually as we go up fairly quickly, you see, um, you may remember Alexander Litvinenko, who was... Um, uh, poisoned by radioactive polonium, uh, who died in London. Uh, you can see uh, that he's had radiation sickness, uh, and obviously it took a number of uh, months uh, before he died. On the top right-hand side, you may react to uh, reactor number four at Chernobyl, um, and those who had exposure, uh, who died within a month, had a typical 6,000 uh, exposure to millisieverts, those who were on scene uh, fairly quickly, so the firefighters, for example, at Chernobyl, uh, had 10,000 plus millisieverts, and they died uh, in a matter of days, hours, and weeks. So, what makes a good chest x-ray? Well, first of all, uh, a clear, justified request with clinical information, i.e. IRMA compliant. You want to have a good quality film. So, what does that mean? Well, you want, ideally, it to be free of artifact, you want to take into account the fact that the patient has a kyphosis or spinal curvature. So, for example, you may see where patients who um, are, um, have a sort of kyphosis and bend forward, uh, often the chin, for example, obstructs uh, the view of the apices. You want to uh, get the ideal projection, which is posterior anterior. You may also request an erect film, for example, and you may see that uh, requested when you are concerned about perforated viscous. AP or anterior posterior, typically done in A&E settings or portable ones. Resar simply reflects the fact of where that x-ray is done. The reason that they put resus on there is to reflect the fact that there's often a high amount of artifact um, and so that you have to bear that in mind when interpreting the x-ray and that the penetration quality of the film uh, may not be uh, very good. Sometimes, although we don't do them as much as we used to, you may do a lateral film. You may see normal abnormalities, so for example, ECG leads, nipple piercings, breast implants, permanent pacemaker wires, oxygen tubing, uh, endotracheal tube, and so on. This is one of the fundamental principles of good radiology interpretation, is to avoid the satisfaction of search. And what do I mean by that? Let's say, let's go back to our patient with left basal crackles again. You see the pneumonia on chest x-ray and think, aha, you've got the diagnosis and diagnose a patient with pneumonia. Although you'd be correct if you miss the fact that he has a very bulky right-sided hyla, do a lateral film and miss the fact that he's got 
a uh, tumor, then obviously uh, you've missed a very serious diagnosis. So it's important to bear that in mind and to do a 360 appraisal, if you like, of the chest x-ray. So technical evaluation. So um, I use the acronym RIP, Rotation, Inspiration and Penetration. So rotation is uh, checking the medial borders of the clavicle are midway from the spinous process of the projected vertebral body. Don't worry, I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. Inspiration, you should be able to see 10 ribs posteriorly on a PA film and 5 to 7 anteriorly. Penetration is this idea that you should be able to see the thoracic border projected through the heart border. And again, I'll show you some examples in a moment. So looking at rotation now, so the, the first diagram on the top right hand side shows an unrotated film. You'll notice from the arrows that effectively the distance between uh, the thoracic vertebrae and the clavicular heads are equal on both sides. On the bottom two, uh, there is rotation on both of those films, as you can see uh, by the difference in length of the arrows. When looking at a exposed film, let's starting at the left hand side, as you can see it's an underexposed film. You effectively have a blob um, without having a better descriptive word in the middle and you just basically have um, lots of white, for example, where the scapula are. There's no projection of vertebrae and you can't discern any meaningful, clinically diagnostically useful information from that film. So this is an underexposed film. The correct exposure, which is the middle uh, x-ray, you can see the vertebrae through the heart border, which is exactly what you want. On the right-hand side, a very overexposed film where you can see through the ribs and vertebrae, again, you can't make any diagnostically useful uh, lung parenchyma. The uh, heart borders are obliterated by overpenetration. In fact, you can see the ribs um, through the heart, which is obviously a not a normal phenomenon. So, little trick for you, the A, B, C, D, E of a chest x-ray states the ID of the patient, projection, technical quality. You want to think OSCE now, uh, chest x-ray and chest x-ray interpretation is perfect OSCE fodder. So, as is typical with a acute medicine, there is an A, B, C, D, E. A is for airway, where you look at the trachea, neck tissues and lung apex. B for breathing, where you look at the bronchus and lung parenchyma. C for cardiac, where you look at the heart, calcification, infiltration, and the mediastinum. D, diaphragm, for free air and elevation. And E for everything else. But it's important that you don't miss anything else. Look at the bones, shoulders, and the ribs. So looking at the top here, uh, you've got the trachea here. Uh, here you have the carina, which is where the uh, bronchus splits into the left and right main bronchus. Here you'll have the mediastinum. Here you have the right heart border. Here you have uh, the uh, diaphragm. You've got your thoracic to lumbar vertebrae. Looking at the airway now, you can see on both of these uh, chest x-rays that the airway is pushed across as shown by the arrow. Looking at the first one, you have the tension pneumothorax. Now ideally, a tension pneumothorax is something that you've diagnosed way before you get the imaging and have already done something about it. You can see that the lung is entirely black on the right hand side and that's usually from say traumatic uh, thoracic injury where the lung chest wall acts as like a one way valve. As you breathe in, the lung expands to create tension, shifting all of your uh, anatomy across so you get a shifted mediastinum. The lung completely collapses as you can see in the midline of the chest x-ray and you can see where the dotted arrows are. Uh, where the um, trachea has been pushed across. On the second film, again, you can see uh, with the dashed line where the trachea has been pushed over to the left. On the left-hand side, you have um, basically what you describe as almost a complete whiteout, and that simply means that you can't determine anything anatomical or clinical, apart from that there's probably lots and lots of fluid in that lung. So this is probably a massive right pleural effusion what we don't know is whether there's consolidated lung underneath it, for example. 
looking at the left of the side you have lots of patchy infiltrate and this could be a patient who has ARDS, pneumocystis pneumonia or pulmonary fibrosis. It's important when interpreting a chest x-ray or at least presenting a chest x-ray you want to think about what it is that you're trying to get across. So for example are you talking about a left upper lobe pneumonia or are you talking about a left middle zone pneumonia which is still the left upper lobe? Sounds confusing doesn't it? But actually when we look at chest x-rays we tend to refer to uh, where the abnormality is is in uh, the zone. So for example left upper, left middle, left lower, right upper, right middle, right lower. You'll also notice there is an important difference here and the reason that I'm pointing this out is you'll notice that the left lung does not have a middle lobe. And in fact, actually, the left lobe on a PA film takes up about 80% of the chest X-ray. The right upper and right middle are of similar sizes, and both the left and right lower lobe are similar in size, although the left is bigger. And that's why it's important that you appreciate when you're talking about uh, uppers and lowers, whether you're talking about the lobes or the zones of the chest X-ray. So looking at the parenchyma now, B for breathing, you can see what looks like consolidated lung. Um, and you've got the all green arrow, the one that's at the upper end pointing to the rib, and the lower one pointing to where the diaphragm ordinarily would be. Now, what you'll notice is that the consolidation, which basically looks like radiological cloud. You'll also notice that as you go up, track your eyes from the consolidation upwards, you'll see lots of black in between the patches of cloud. And these are known as air bronchograms. And that simply reflects the fact that there is air passage in between uh, pus-filled sacs. And again, this represents a very classical example of a pneumonia. What's the diagnosis? Give you a few seconds to think about it. Hopefully you'll appreciate that this is a left large uh, pleural effusion as demonstrated by the air fluid level um, towards the top of the left lung. This is the type of patient that we would investigate with ultrasound, pleural aspiration and maybe proceed to um, CT of the thorax. What's the diagnosis here? There is a large right-sided pneumothorax as evidenced by the arrows. You can see that actually when we look at the hyla there's probably a difference of about four centimeters between the rib cage and the uh, where the lung tissue has collapsed to. Again this is the type of patient that rather than a temporal aspiration we would actually go ahead and put in a, a chest strain. Diagnosis. Well you'll probably notice the rather large blob looking uh, on the uh, left side or left lower zone, um, this is probably a malignancy. Sometimes if you see multiples of shapes like this, these are known as cannonball infiltrates. And in young men, for example, this would make you concerned about testicular cancer. Uh, sometimes breast, um, prostate um, will also uh, cause cannonball infiltrates as well as renal tumours. It's important that when you are looking at your chest x-ray, uh, and which this picture demonstrates nicely, that you have a, perhaps even take a step back, look at your chest x-ray as a whole, and look at it from a 360 degree view. You'll notice that A points to a relatively small abnormality, but when we then do slices of that uh, in the CT scanner in image B, you can see that there is a spiculated mass here. And again, this is probably a early lung cancer. When we look at the lung parenchyma, you can either look at it in a segmental approach or a bat wing or pulmonary appearance. So segmental or alveolar opacification is classically caused by pneumonia, lobar collapse, pulmonary infarct from pulmonary embolism. Um, the closest analogy is like a myocardial ischemia where uh, unlike the heart, you basically have a blockage due to pulmonary embolus and therefore that the lung tissue behind that embolism is starved of oxygen, therefore dies and shows up as an infarct, often like a wedge. Lung cancer, lung hemorrhage and pulmonary edema. 
uh, pulmonary or bat wing appearances are, are often bilateral hence the bat wing uh, mnemonic and uh, is often caused by cardiac failure ARDS drowning aspiration uh, atypical pneumonia lymphoma and sarcoid what's the diagnosis well this looks like a bilateral bat wing appearance um, but you'll notice that the two blue arrows are pointing to uh, fluid in the horizontal fissure the heart appears enlarged even allowing for an AP projection so this is probably acute uh, or congestive cardiac failure the green arrow draws your attention to a ECG lead which is going up to the left shoulder again it's important that if you are asked to interpret a chest x-ray in an exam and you see these artifacts it's important to point them out as sometimes they are important so for example a central line that's been inserted would be a very important artifact and you would not want to comment on something like that what etiologies might you be concerned about this is a bit of an extreme chest x-ray as you can see but there are bilateral patchy infiltrates particularly prominent on the left as you can see so what etiologies well this should be making you think about atypical this is not a normal chest x-ray by any stretch of the imagination simple pneumonias are often localized to one lobe um, of the ch of the lungs this, as you can see, has multi-lobar involvement on both sides. You'd be concerned about fungal infection, HIV, pneumocystis, uh, and so on. You'd be thinking about viral infections as well, or viral infections with super agent pneumonia. Uh, topically, for example, the current COVID-19 outbreak shows some x-rays like this. If you're interested in seeing particularly COVID-19 chest x-rays, if you email me uh, where my email address is at the end, I can forward you a portfolio of COVID-19 chest x-rays. So where's the pathology? Well, looking at this one, again, you can see the upper low vessels are quite prominent and there are bulky highly, the pulmonary vessels are quite prominent. Again, it's important that sometimes you can be forgiven for thinking there are lots of nodules uh, coming at you uh, in the chest x-ray but remember of course the chest x-ray is just one projection the lungs of course work three-dimensionally and so therefore some of the what looks like nodules uh, are actually just vessels coming towards you in that plane so where's the pathology and what do we need to do next I hope one of the th uh, your eyes are uh, draw your attention to uh, the left lung towards the bottom you'll notice there is a rim of black underneath a very thin rim of tissue the thin rim of tissue of course being the diaphragm and you'll notice that there is air tracking all the way across the abdomen from left to right and this is a perforated viscous so whether it's a perforated gastric ulcer duodenal ulcer or perforated bowel we won't know so what do we do next obviously we want to uh, involve my surgical colleagues and uh, organize an urgent CT abdo pelvis we want to know urgently where the perforation is coming from this patient will probably need to go for a laparotomy which specialty should review this patient this is one of my favorite chest x-rays and for those that have seen this tutorial before will know and hopefully won't have forgotten uh, when I asked the uh, tutorial groups what they thought we had everything from ID to renal uh, to cardiology to respiratory medicine but actually the specialty is orthopedics if you have a quick look at the top hu uh, left sided humerus you might notice quite a nasty humeral shaft fracture of the left uh, humerus so actually it's orthopedics that should see this patient and not any of the medical specialties Uh, to have a quick look at this chest x-ray now you'll notice that where the arrow is pointing to is a high fullness again it's really important that you appreciate what looks abnormal if you detect something that's so abnormal you're probably right uh, obviously the mediastinum can just look appear larger than what you think it would be once you've seen lots of chest x-rays it does become a little bit easier if we do a lateral chest x-ray you can see that there is an anterior mediastinal mass again this is a type of mass that we do ebus or endobronchial ultrasound or perhaps do a ct guided biopsy as this patient certainly has a tumor and finally what's the pathology here well there is none um, certainly i don't describe having nipple rings as uh, being pathological it uh, might not be my thing, but there's nothing pathological about it. So this is one of those um, normal abnormalities. 
and again one of my favorite slides what do you notice about the diagnosis here I would just suggest that in order to get the diagnosis that you concentrate your eyes in the middle uh, of the chest x-ray uh, I'll just see if I can get the laser pointer up now now if you for example train your eyes around here you'll notice that there is an air fluid level here this is a hiatus hernia that's quite a significant one which is pushing up through the diaphragmatic wall and so your air fluid level is from your stomach uh, that is pushing upwards so this is a hiatus hernia there's no obvious lung parenchyma so if you have any questions uh, or you have any comments about the tutorials, please don't hesitate to email me at james.piper at ucl.ac.uk. Uh, as I say, this um, webinar will go up on YouTube uh, under my YouTube channel, and I'll also send out PDFs. Any problems, get in touch and take care. Bye-bye.